what NIL is in college football right now, and I'm not even talking about whether we like it or not. I'm just saying what it is and the different dynamic in play. Uh, there are a lot of folks who were really terrified when the idea first got presented. Well, there are some folks who were terrified that we were going to pay college players. And then they had the wool pulled back off their eyes, and they said, oh, okay, it's just going to look a little different. And then uh, another group of people said, but what's this going to do to locker rooms? You know, God forbid the fact that someone who is making the university a disproportionate amount of money is actually going to have more money in his pocket. So I talk to you all the time about this. I don't think either one of us have a problem with that as a concept, but it's the dynamic in the locker room that is really interesting. So we were talking about Bama a second ago. I've talked about Ohio State with this entire theme of when they know they don't have an elite quarterback in the spring and it's a really talented group, sometimes collectively that can galvanize you and that can raise the play of everybody. Well, it's the same way with NIL. When you don't have that big earner, when you don't have that shark in the locker room, maybe there's not that mentality of, oh, he'll do it. He, he's the big earner. He'll do it. They all know we're, we're kind of, from an earnings perspective, we're kind of all on a rookie contract here. We, we're kind of all the same, yeah. so we got to all pull the same weight. I, I think fans need to understand the multiple ways that this works. Um, I honestly get frustrated when we say NIL. Because I think if we took a giant, you know, a pie and we broke up the percentages of it, I think there is a much larger portion of it that is not really NIL, so to speak, than actually is. Now, is, is Caleb Williams on the Dr. Pepper commercials this year? Yes. Does Kate Klubnick have a Roback deal? Yes. Those are, those are real NIL deals. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know that enticement and it's not even pay for play. It's pay to attend. It's it's here's like I mean I was on a coaching call with Rick Stock still today and I was talking about how does NIL affect your team I want to hear your stance on it and he said we're proud of how we manage things and run things but the guys who have left our program that go start somewhere else they have left because they've been offered money through NIL and that there's nothing we can do about that there's a there's a large understanding that that's what college football is and where it is Josh but I don't. I don't view that as NIL. If, you, if we're giving somebody $200,000 to come to school here and then hopefully go play, that's not utilizing name, image, and likeness. That's giving you money to just come give it a shot, in my opinion. Now, there are also collectives that are all used in all kinds of different ways. But the way that I think a lot of the coaches would like that to be is, okay, we have $200,000 or $2 million dollars Let's give our 85 scholarship guys X amount a month for the entirety that you play football here. That could be 5,000 a month, 10,000 a month, whatever that is. And then let the chips fall where they may when a Brock Bowers can go get a deal with Josh Page Barbecue or Caleb Williams can get a deal at, you know, Cole Kubelik's tire change place. And that's an extra 2,000, 20,000, 100,000 dollars, whatever that is. I think that's the intended way that a lot of coaches saw it and sort of wanted it to be. It's not really that. Does it affect the locker room? You bet your rear end it does. I've talked to multiple head coaches that have said what a problem it is. Guys see the next guy get whatever, and they get mad. I've heard stories about guys in the parking lot of where the collective is housed yelling at the people inside because so-and-so just got a nicer car than he did. And then to go even further, you bringing up Alabama a little bit, I, I think when you look last year at that football team, Bryce Young and Will Anderson, they were the two biggest earners through NIL. They were also the two best football players. Subconsciously, it's hard for me to imagine that there wasn't a little bit of, okay, well, he always bails us out, so he'll go bail us out again, right? But then further down the line of, well, he's he's a, he does the Dr. Pepper commercial, right? Like, he gets $7 million a year, $2 million. Like, let him do it. He's a guy get all the money. He'll do it. He's the one that everybody wants to pay. <laughs> Go for it. We forget that these are 18, 19, 20-year-olds sometimes. And just from, an, from a maturity standpoint, that's the way your brain operates. You haven't had enough life experience to understand that that's not just how things always have to be or because they seem that way. So I think it affects you in a lot of different ways. There's, gonna, there's a lot of gimme, 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 more, 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 my, my, mind, me, me, me. And, and it forces that to a certain extent. I'm not against guys making money. I'm not mad when a guy gets a legitimate deal, but the way that some of the other parts of it operate, it can ruin a locker room. And even when it's not intended to, and it shouldn't because the guys are making money because they're great football players, 
there's going to be jealousy, there's going to be envy, and there's going to be guys that sit back and say, okay, well, if you're earning all that money, you go make the play. You go throw the touchdown. You go get the sack. We'll be over here waiting on our turn once you leave to try to go get paid next. Here's what's crazy. Now, this is what would probably surprise a lot of people. There's a thought that when you watch a team raise a trophy and the confetti falls on them at the end of the year, they must have had a rock-solid, perfect culture, angelic, borderline angelic culture. And what, what I've seen, I know good and well you've seen it in years past, so not to specifically mention any one team, because there's more than one, is you'll watch a team who's getting ready to play for a title. You'll watch a team who's won a title, and you've covered them in week six. And I've sat there and talked to three other staffers, and they've let you know, dude, it's kind of a disaster right now behind the scenes. Not, not <laughs> holistically, but we got this happening. We got this dude at this dude's throat. Uh, this assistant coach is, is all kind of issues all around him in that, in that lane over there. And it's, it, it, what it does to me is it makes me appreciate so much what a head coach has on his plate. I don't know when a head coach ever gets time to talk about football. I don't, I don't know where he ever gets time to focus on football. And that was before the whole NIL thing and the transfer portal thing got thrown in there. And so, I mean, it's, it's kind of a different topic, but it's also not. What I'm trying to say is you're, you're trying to just hold it together. That's what you're trying to do. Right. You're, you're never going to have a perfect culture. You're never going to have that, that utopian we're, we're all in it for each other. We're not going to focus on self. It's all going to be about we. That doesn't exist. If you've got humans in a locker room to, to, a, to an 85 or a 115 or 120 kind of number, that won't happen. It's which coach can just hold it together. Like when, when I have my hands clasped, there's going to be a little pull apart there. Just which coach can make sure the hands don't separate entirely. Those are the ones winning right now. It's one of the things that you give Kirby Smart so much credit for the last couple of years, how you can have guys that are going to go in the top 10 or the top 15 or the top 20 who statistically maybe just put the best defense up in the history of this game that we love so much that we've watched, still believing that they're not good at what they do, either individually or collectively. It's incredible. And he found ways to do that. One of the things I think you and I are sort of falling in love with with this Alabama team this year are the stories coming out about Deontay Lawson yelling at a guy and MFing a guy because he didn't want to come do extra conditioning after practice, which was not required by the staff, mind you, but him saying, this is what we do and how we do it. So if you don't want to do it this way, get, find another place to go play football. It's amazing everything taking. And I think the other part too, Josh, is that the last few years, so many things have hit these coaches in the face that they weren't necessarily ready for. NIL, really cool. It's great. They weren't ready for it. Nope. Nobody was truly ready for it. And I, I, I'm i convinced that even the teams like Texas A&M that seemingly had it all figured out, there were some accidents along the way in which they just happened to have things set up the right way or happened to have the right people in charge of it. And the, the transfer portal, do you think these coaches were ready for guys to, in, in the middle of the season to say, yeah, I'm out, I'm, I'm portal, I'm gone. And the biggest problem in all of that is that college football players are smarter than they've ever been. They are constantly learning how to game the system. I'll give you an example. Last year, towards the end of the season, I had never heard of this. I didn't know this was happening. I never thought about this potentially taking place. There was a pretty big problem, kind of a groundswell that was happening that nobody heard about and nobody was talking about with college football players that were rolling up on having played in four games this year, which we know the new red shirt rules put in place, something the NCAA probably didn't think about as being a byproduct of this. And coaches damn sure didn't sit back and go, okay, now let me see here. When we get to four games, this kid's going to say, I ain't playing anymore. How are we going to deal with that, Joey? Okay, cool. Let's take that down. Not a real thing, but players who played on special teams, had reserve roles or rotational roles that were coming to coaches saying, hey, coach, um, I've played four games and I want to save my red shirt, so I ain't going back in this year. I'm sorry, yep. what? Yep. Oh, and I, I don't know if you understood. I don't want to play any more football for you. Oh, I'll, I'll practice. I'll be scout team guy, uh, which, by the way, I would never in my life would it come out of my mouth to say I want to be on scout team. Uh, but you had guys, and they handled it in different ways. Some guys didn't say anything. Lincoln Riley was very public about it. He had a receiver, and he said, 
yeah, man, you can help us. So go to the practice squad and work against my DBs every day. I'm, I'm cool with it. Now, that's fully grasping probably where we are in college football today. But other guys that I know that I talked to essentially said, goodbye. We're done. Don't need you. Don't want you. And there were other I, I talked to one SEC coach that said, we had to figure out ways that this kid could still utilize our academic center because it was tied to our athletic facility. And I didn't want him around my team yep. because you just said you don't want to be here anymore. So I think these new waves of things, I don't know what to call them, that coaches have to deal with and manage are hitting every single year. And that only gives you more, more things that you got to worry about, more things that you got to do, and more people that you essentially have to babysit, I guess. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy to think about what they have to try and deal with on a daily basis.